The cerebrospinal fluid is the lifeblood of the central nervous system. Stay tuned because you will discover the functional mechanics that aid in the production and circulation of CSF and the structural mechanics of the meningeal system. Hi there, I'm Dr. Krista, founder of the American Posture Institute and your host on Peds Week Online, the pediatrics virtual summit for healthcare professionals. It's an honor to introduce our next guest presenter. Dr. Martin Rosen, founder of the Peak Potential Institute, has traveled nationally and internationally teaching the SOT chiropractic technique, pediatrics, and cranial adjusting. He offers premier educational programs for the chiropractic profession and has a private practice helping children and families. Today, he'll be teaching us why the CSF is the lifeblood of the central nervous system. Dr. Marty, thank you so much for joining us in the Pediatrics Virtual Summit. Please take it away. Thank you for having me there. I'm looking forward to this. So we're going to talk a little bit about something that I think a lot of chiropractors don't pay a lot of attention to, and that is essential, the cerebral spinal fluid, and its effect on the overall health and well-being. So I like this quote. It was a study that done in 2013, and they say, we believe that for every neurological disease that has an immune component to it, these vessels may play a major role. These vessels, of course, are the vessels of the cerebral spinal fluid mechanism. So CSF is basically an ultrafiltrate of platelets and it contains within ventricles in the brain, it forms some vital functions, including providing nourishment, removing waste and protection to the brain. It is predominantly formed in the choroid plexus, but it has other intricate factors that deal with the production and the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. It is in constant secretion. It's being exchanged about five times every 24 hours, and it contributes, the reduction of it contribute to waste buildup in the central nervous system. One of the foundations of the central nervous system and the foundations of CSF is the German meningeal system, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. But the foundation of the German meningeal system is laid down in the first two slides. So CSF also provides protection to the neuroaxis through two mechanisms. It works as a shock absorber and it also allows the brain and spine to cord become buoyant, reducing the effective weight of it. What's so important in the pediatric practice is that the brain will grow Two, twice its size in the first year of life. The cerebellum itself will grow 240%. So the fact that there's enough cerebral spinal fluid to allow the brain to be um, to grow and to develop correctly is a very important part in the particular process of developing optimal potential. The choroid plexus is the area where most CSF is formed, and it plays a role in the regularization, not only of CSF, but of stem cells in the brain, which are produced in the lateral ventricles. They play an important role in the immune system of the brain as well. So you can start to see how important the movement and production of CSF is to the overall health and general well-being, not only the child, but of course, all of us. There are several things that contribute to the movement of CSF. One is your respiratory motion. The second is the cardiac influences as blood brain barrier changes occur and fluid is exchanged through that. Then also what's called the sacral occipital motion influence. That was what Dijonet talked about, about the reciprocal motion between the sacrum and the occiput and how it not only changes dural meningeal tension, but actually helps pump cerebral spinal fluid. And then of course the dural meningeal influence. The dural meningeal influence plays a significant role in the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. And again, that foundation is laid down in infancy. And so what we're going to talk about in a few minutes is how the posture, the muscles, the fascia, and the dura all interplay to create movement, not only cerebral spinal fluid, but change tension within the central nervous system. So one of the things that we look at, and there's been studies, is that cerebral spinal fluid, it, the movement of it is influenced by respiratory excursions. Deep inhalation and exhalation play an important role in the movement of cerebral spinal fluid. And as we all know, the diaphragm, one of the main transverse fascial plane, plays a significant role in how we breathe and how much oxygen we take in and how much we can expel. So postural muscles that attach to the diaphragm and the transverse fascial planes, especially the psoas muscle, play a large role in how our respiratory function occurs. During these phases of respiration, there is a change in the pattern and it is repeatable in each individual. So even little infants that tend to be, let's say, colicky and very bloated and they have a bloated abdomen and can't take deep breaths or they're crying and take short staccato breaths, this affects the movement of cerebral spinal fluid, which in the primary respiratory phases and in the early stages of infancy can affect not only brain growth, but actually affect neuroplasticity and health of gray matter and white matter cells. So these fluid movements are also dependent on a second thing, which is the cardiac pulse. 
especially at the blood brain barrier. The ventricles also along the spine create respiratory motion and also can play compression forces, move CSF. So what do we have to think of? What is the influence of posture and the movement of CSS, CSF fluid in the human being? Well, gravity plays a crucial role, not only in the movement of CSF, but in the development of not only neuroplastic patterns, but actually in ossification centers in the bone. So as the child is going through their primary reflex stages and also through their milestone stages, these change structural stresses and gravitational forces on the cerebral spinal fluid mechanism, the dural meningeal system, and across the bones. One of the things that we talk about when we talk about cranial work is that the actual stress on the dural meningeal system acts as gravitational forces to change and remodel cranial bones. So kids with plagiocephaly, scaphalocephaly, things like that, those stresses are great on the dural meningeal system, but also affect movement of cerebral spinal fluid. So what we want to talk about is both longitudinal and transverse fascial planes. The fascial system directly attached to the musculoskeletal system, the dural meningeal system and actually attaches to the epineurium of the nerve. So the velocity of CSF is controlled by actually how well the spine is lined up. For example, patients with spinal stenosis, they had significantly higher velocity of CSF fluid at the places of narrowing. So what that means is it changes spinal imbalances, whether it be at the dural ports or at the, at the vertebral level, spinal level, can actually change the speed of the flow in CSF too fast or too slow, just like neurological impulses can affect the health of the individual. The two types of motion that we mainly talk about that are influenced CSF movement is what's called the primary respiratory mechanism. And that is the relationship between the sacrum and the occiput. And it's a reciprocal motion has to do with non-sacral mutation and two, with the sphenobasal mechanism and its movement and its ability to pump cerebral spinal fluid and make motion in the cranial joints. And also again, back down attachment to the dural meningitis in the sacrum mood in the sacrum. The second, which we talked about a minute ago, is the secondary respiratory mechanism or diaphragmatic motion. This motion is very strongly structurally mediated. So any changes in head posture, pelvic balance can affect this, the secondary respiratory mechanism and the transverse fascial plane. Posture, forward head posture, affects airway development and function of the TMJ. The fascial attachments we're gonna talk about Skeletal aspects, the spine, pelvis, and cranium all play a role in how the tension in the dural meningeal system is mitigated throughout. And then, of course, that affects directly, as we said, the nervous system as the nerves attach to the epineurum of the dural meningeal system. These all affect all these fluid systems, the blood-brain barrier, CSF in the ventricles, and the lymphatic system, which also is the CSF system, which is the lymphatic system for the central nervous system. The largest amount of fascia in the body is distributed in a longitudinal place. And these body, these fascia are laid down templates for how the body balances and reacts to gravitational forces. So when we look at these longitudinal fascial planes, one of the big ones that we're talking about are, is the thoracolumbar fascia, which covers the deep muscles of the back and trunk. It also attaches to all the nerves in the thoracic spine that make up the sympathetic nervous system. So we're talking about fight or flight states or sympathetic nervous system imbalance. We're also talking about stress in the thoracolumbar fascia. So again, we're looking at the erector spinae, the posterior and thigh muscle, and anterior thigh muscle. These are longitudinal fascial planes and fibers. So for example, distortions in the pelvis can affect the sartorius muscle, which is again, one of the longest muscles in the body, and that'll affect the longitudinal fascia in both in the anterior thigh muscle. The other thing that we look at are the transverse fascial planes. These include the pelvic diaphragm, respiratory diaphragm, thoracic inlet or first rib, the suboccipital muscles, and then the tentorium cerebelli in the cranium. What these look like is again, we have our pelvic diaphragm. I'm just gonna kind of push through these for a minute. We have a respiratory diaphragm. If you look here, you can also see the psoas muscle attaches to the crew of the diaphragm. So the psoas muscle being a hip flexor um, can put stress on the diaphragm. One of the things we see in the pediatric practice is a child who may be crawling with one hip raised or one leg raised, they don't have a normal cross crawl. Very often contracture of the psoas muscle will be a cause of that, why the hip flexor doesn't release all the way. It also is a sign that there is tension in the diaphragm. And back to the pediatric practice, when the diaphragm gets stressed, it can affect the area right at the cardiac 
sphincter area here where the diaphragm, the cardiac, the stomach, and the esophagus all meet, which means if it stretches that and distorts that valve, you can get symptoms like colic, silent reflux, acid reflux, because that valve can't seal all the way and fluids can come back to the esophagus. So it's very common in the pediatric practice to see psoas muscle contractions also affecting the transverse fascial plane of the diaphragm. Then we have, of course, the first rib, that inlet up here. And in the pediatric practice, again, the biggest stress that we see is the upper cervical spine. So these muscles up here along the suboccipital musculature form a transverse fascial plane at the level of the occiput and above. This is also extremely strong attachment area for the dural meningeal system. So subluxations of this area affect not only that transverse fascial plane, they also affect the vagus nerve as it exits the jugular foramen, and they also affect the rotational component of the cervical spine and the attachments to the dura right at that point. So there's extreme tension at the base of the brain and base of the brain stem, and that affects processing as well as the cerebellum in the first year of life has to grow 240% so that can work as a mainframe processing center into the cranium. Just look at one of the things that we look nature of the triangulation patterns in the spine and the musculature. We have a quadratus lumborum and a multifidus here. If you look here, our rectus spiny, but I really want you to notice is the triangulation patterns. Triangles in nature are very strong forces. And so all these muscles create triangulation patterns throughout the spine, coming all the way from the pelvis to the base of the cranium. If you stress these triangulation patterns, you create compensatory patterns and gravitational stresses on the bones. This also changes bone remodeling. Abnormal gravitational stresses or abnormal muscle pulling on bones changes the osteoblastic to osteoclastic deposition and can actually remodel bones, which is why when we start to make adjustments, let's say for a child with a scoliosis, and we start to balance the pelvis and get the second cervical vertebrae over the second sacral segment, we can actually change the way the bones will start to remodel in a positive way. So if the posture stays distorted for long periods of time, you're going to get bone remodeling in a negative way. As the posture shifts and changes, you'll get bone remodeling in a positive way. And of course, in the pediatric practice or children, especially before they hit preteens, there's the strongest amount of time of bone remodeling to occur. The older we get, the slower it takes. So again, here's our friend, the psoas muscle. Look at the triangulation pattern it creates with the pelvis as it attaches to the iliac psoas. It's extremely important muscle. It also attaches to the thoracic vertebrae, T11 and T12, and also attaches to the disc and the lumbar spine. So this muscle plays an extremely important role in balancing the pelvis. The other thing we have is underneath is the ligaments. And you can see how these ligaments create, again, triangulation patterns to stabilize. This is the posterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint. And we have the same in the anterior aspect. The only difference is the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint is where the movement of the sacroiliac joint comes. Therefore, where those ligaments you're looking at that form in that area of the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint form what we call the sacral boot mechanism, which is a synovial joint that allows for sacral mutation. So this posterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint is about stabilization. The anterior aspect is about movement. And again, remember the dura attaches all the way down to the tip of the coccyx. So again, here we're looking again, there's our piriformis, our flexigeous muscle. These all form triangulation patterns to help balance the sacrum. The normal motion during respiration occurs with every time you breathe in and out. The two areas that create most of the motion are the sphenobasal angle, which I'm actually going to put up here for a second for you to take a look at. So again, the sphenobasal is between this purple and yellow area. This is a flexion extension. It's a synchondrosis joint that stays mobile for the first 26 years of life. It works in reciprocal motion to the sacrum. So every time you breathe in and out, the sacral base goes posterior, the sphenobasal angle rises, the vertebral column straightens as a whole, and the ventricles in the cranium fill. Every time you breathe out, the exact opposite happens. The sacral base goes anterior, the sphenobasal drops back, the curves of the spine restore, and the ventricles begin to empty. So the pressure within the cerebral spinal fluid also helps move the sacrum and the occiput, depending on how the ventricles fill and how what's called the lumbar cistern or the sacral well moves at the base behind the sacrum at the sacral, sacral, sacral second sacral segment. 
This is just kind of a little picture of what happens every time you breathe in the changes in the dermal meningeal system. If you all know, so notice the lumbosacral and the sacral spot on um, the sinobasal angle will get smaller on inhalation and get larger on exhalation. Again, affecting the dermal meningeal system. And remember in infants, this system is so intense because a baby is breathing 30 to 80 times per minute, as opposed to an adult, which is 12 to 16. So this system is really formulating, really pumping. Any imbalance in this system will be manifested three, four, five fold in the infant, number one, because of the speed of its movement, and number two, because the rapid rate of neurological development that's occurring. I just wanted to kind of finish it up with this little study to give you an idea of how important cerebral spinal fluid and lymphatic system is. So this was um, a research, this was done in 2013 and again in 2017. And I want you to look at as a quote down here that says, we know that CSF is very important for brain health and our data suggests that in this large subset of kids, the fluid is not flowing properly. Okay, improper movement of this, if you look right above that, they said that, CSF at stage six and 12 months of age, if there was a higher level of CSF in the cranium, there was a 70% chance that that child had a higher propensity for autism to develop. So again, these toddlers diagnosed with autism had a higher level of CSF, increased CSF pressure in 64 months in their cranium, which meant that they couldn't get proper nutrients, they couldn't get waste products out, and there was abnormal tension causing abnormal neurological development. Every single day, our brain cells communicate with each other, and these communications cause brain byproducts to continually be secreted. And these are also inflammatory proteins that occur, and they have to be filtered out several times a day. The CSF handles this, and then it's replenished with fresh CSF at least four times a day. It acts as a crucial filtration system. So remember, the amount of CSF remained elevated at 12 to 24 months in infants who developed the most severe autism symptoms and he had a greater amount of CSF in 24% greater at six months. The greater amount of CSF at six months was also associated with poorer gross motor skills, such as head and limb control. So what we're saying is increased CSF pressure in the cranium can affect neurological development. No different than when you get a concussion, what happens when you get a concussion? you get inflammation and it puts pressure on the brain. Well, increased pressure on the brain is through not only the blood brain barrier, but increased CSF pressure. So if the CSF can't drain out, for example, if you have a concussion and you get your head and the dural sinuses get clogged and CSF can't drain out of the cranium, that increased pressure causes damage. And we know the whole damage that occur through concussions, but this is pre-symptomatic. In other words, there are increased CSF in the cranium and if it goes undiagnosed and undetected, it will affect how the brain can start to function. So if there's an alteration in the distribution of cerebral spinal fluid that we see on MRIs by six months of age, we found that this increased CSF predicted with nearly 70% accuracy, which babies would be later diagnosed with autism. This is important because proper CSF flow might have downstream effects on the developing brain and it can play a role in the emergence of autism symptoms, which are, as we all know, constantly increasing day after day after day. So CSF is regarded as the equivalent of the lymphatic system carrying away from the cranial and spinal system substances that would not be able to leave at significant rates otherwise. The importance of CSF is temperature control, increased temperature leads to a tendency of seizure activity, In increased CSF can cool the brain areas. If you start to increase the movement of CSF with seizure activity when the brain is overheated, it can reduce the activity, the seizure activity. Waste removal, nutritional supply, cranial bone motion and dural tension, ventricular pressure gradients. It also works as a protective barrier, both a chemical and a physical buffer. As Dr. Krista said a little while ago, my wife and I started the Peak Potential Institute, which offer programs to the chiropractic profession to improve their technical excellence, both online and hands-on seminars we're going to be running. So if you go to peakpotentialprogram.com, you can see that. And the other thing we did during the wonderful COVID times that we had is we put together a book called It's All in the Head. This is not only for chiropractors, it's for lay people as well to get them to understand the importance of chiropractic care, especially in the first 
first year of life and what they can be looking for in their children before the symptoms actually occur, what kind of distortions in the cranium, in the facial muscles, in the milestones, um, in the primal reflexes. So basically it's a handbook for them to know what to look for to help to determine if their child needs to see a chiropractor. And the last thing of course is our Dr. Rosen, where we have our streaming videos and our other books. So I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, as always, I love working with Krista and the stuff she does is always amazing. And if you want to contact me, you can contact me at drmartinrosen at gmail.com. Amazing. Wow, my goodness. Thank you. As always, I have multiple pages of notes. I'm going to do a quick summary and then a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, so we were talking about CSF today as our primary component of our conversation. Now, CSF is an ultrafiltrate of plasma contained in the ventricles of the brain and the subarachnoid space of the cranium and the spine. CSF assists the brain by providing protection, nourishment, and waste removal. The choroid plexus has immune system and product, um, immune system function and production of stem cells. And movement of CSF is controlled via respiration, cardiac control, um, sacral occipital motion, dural meningeal influence. And there's significant um, caudal CSF movement occurs during deep exhalation with a corresponding cephalod movement during inhalation. And postural muscles that attach to the diaphragm and psoas, such as the psoas, play a large role in respiration control. And fluid movements are dependent on cardiac pulse, especially at the blood-brain barrier. So what is the influence of posture? Gravity has a huge influence on CSF. And with cranial work, um, there could be stress on dural meningeal system that can impact movement of the CSF and the cranial position. Velocity of CSF is controlled by spinal alignment. Spinal stenosis, for example, can impact the speed of flow. Um, primary respiratory mechanism, so reciprocal motion determined by CSF mechanism or mechanics, um, which is self-regulating. And then secondary motion, diaphragmatic influences. When we talk about posture, if, for example, the patient has forward head posture, which of course is very common postural distortion pattern, this affects airway development and function, um, fascial attachment and dural tension that can affect fluid systems. The largest amount of fascia is distributed in a longitudinal plane. So for example, the thoracolumbar um, fascia and the pelvic distortions can affect the sartorius muscle. And then you talked about the transverse plane. So for example, the diaphragm, how the psoas attaches to the diaphragm, stress diaphragm um, can impact cardiac sphincter, which can lead to colicky babies, um, also impact acid reflux. And then the tentorium cerebelli and suboccipital muscles affect the transverse plane, the vagus nerve and dural tension. Um, tri triangulation patterns of muscles from the pelvis to the cranium, stress leads to compensatory patterns. So when we have stress, the triangulation patterns, it leads to compensations, which can lead to bone remodeling in a positive or negative way, right? So if it's, you know, if we have long-term postural distortion patterns, that's negative bone remodeling. Um, again, talking about the psoas, that triangulation pattern to balance the pelvis pelvis, and then ligaments, the posterior and anterior sacroiliac ligaments allows for sacral nutation, anterior for movement and posterior for stabilization. And then when we breathe in and breathe out the sphenobasal or angle, which is a synchondrosis joint that's mobile for 26 years, the pressure within the CSF helps move the sacrum and the occiput. Um, and then as we inhale, the spine lengthen, lengthens and with exhalation, the spine uh, length decreases. And then you wrapped up by talking about CSF and lymphatic system. Um, faulty CSF flows, uh, flow as one of the possible causes of autism. Really interesting study right there. Um, you know, if there's a higher level of CSF in the cranium, it was associated with an increased chance of autism, needs CSF movement, um, and CSF replenishes at least four times per day for crucial filtration. Now more CSF equals poor motor control impacts neurodevelopment and was associated with uh, the development of autism. And then alteration of distribution of CSF equals increased CSF leading to autism. Poor CSF flow is important for proper brain development. And the effects of CSF are, are of course, uh, temperature control, waste removal, nutrition, cranial bone motion, and neural tension, ventricular pressure gradients. Really important conversation today. So awesome. a couple of questions for you yes. um, regarding assessment and then of course correction. Sure. So when you are doing assessments for pediatric mm -hmm. patients, for babies, as well as pediatric patients um, during the school age years, and you're watching them breathe and mm -hmm. you do a posture assessment, what are your first indications that the patient could have compromised movement of the CSF? Is it going to be through respiration or posture or both? And then what are we going to do for our recommendations for a treatment plan from there? So good. So first of all, if we're talking about a lot of the um, evaluation we first do was with the preambulatory infant. So that's done in prone and supine. And one of the keys for that is to check the dermal tension at C1, C2. 
Okay, there's two things we look at there. Um, the ability of the baby to turn the head without creating what we call a heel tension reflex, because that'll show dermalingual tension all the way down the spine. The second thing we look at is the motion between the sacrum and the occiput. So when they're in the prone position, as we palpate the motion of the sacrum and the occiput to see if there's a normal reciprocal motion. As they become ambulatory, then some of the things we look at are very similar to what you would look at for any postural thing. We're looking at a child with a forward head posture. One of the things we're really looking for, if they're old enough to do it as gelée test. And the reason for that is what you'll find is often if they do a gelée test and one leg comes back normal and the other one, they compensate the hip like that. What it's telling us is that there's some kind of pelvic distortion okay, which is affecting the transverse fascial plane. Often the psoas muscle is involved because the hip flexors are being locked up and then that goes up to the diaphragm. So if we're seeing that kind of um, situation, we'll do that. The other thing that we look for is a forward head posture with a posterior mandible, because that's telling us that not only are they traction the dural meningeal system, but what they're also doing the posterior mandible is closing off the airway and they will tend to be maybe um, either mouth breathers because they can't get through their nose or they will not be able to extrude, extrude their mandible far enough out and basically, if I exaggerate, if I push my mandible back, it's going to flatten my cervical curve. If I lengthen my mandible, it's going to extend it. So a very posterior mandible with a forward head posture is a really big sign that there is some kind of dural stress pattern and that it's going to affect CSF. The other piece just around it is in my world, there's nothing that doesn't affect the movement of CSF flow because anytime you, deal, you change posture, then you're going to affect the muscles then you affect the fascia, then you affect the dermal and in your system. So the changes in that, and as we talked about in the lecture a few minutes ago, any time you narrow a passageway for CSF, you're going to increase the speed of CSF, which is going to reduce its ability to function normally and to remove waste products and do its job. Just like if a nerve fires too fast or too slow, that's not good. Timing is what it's all about. Nice. And for all of our um, children who are so sedentary these days, you know, sedentary pre-pandemic and then now spending more time at home in front of screens, you know, not being outside in social isolation, who are seated more. So they're having less motion of their spine, less motion of their bodies. How do you, um, how do you think that this is impacting their CSF movement and what, you know, if you had a crystal ball, what long-term effects do you think this could have for them? So sitting, for long periods of time, the number one thing it does is it locks the sacroiliac joint. So the two prime movers that we talked about is the ability for the sacral nutation to occur, which only occurs when you're standing or walking. And the second thing is the sphenobasal mechanism. And the other thing that stresses the sphenobasal mechanism when these kids are sitting all the time and looking at screens is they're flexing their head. So they're keeping their head in flexion, they're locking their sacroiliac joint and they're getting no motion. So that's why you have these kids. And what it does is it fires off very often. So if you don't get enough oxygen, one of the things you do, if your oxygen is getting cut off, you create a fight or flight state, right? And you sort of get anxious. And so what we're seeing with these kids, especially during this whole time, you know, this whole COVID time is a high levels of anxiety, basically mm -hmm. mental illness, because what's happening is their brain is not processing okay? because they're basically in a depleted oxygen state. And if you want to add on a mask to that, sitting in a classroom with a mask on and not getting high levels of oxygen, it creates an anxiety. Okay, and it creates a chronic anxiety state. And what we're going to be dealing with over the next generation is a, a massive amount of children who are going to be extremely stressed. They're going to have high anxiety rates. They're going to have lower thresholds, higher propensity of immune system disease or immune system, uh, autoimmune, sorry, autoimmune problems. And they're also going to be dealing a lot more with hypersensitivity allergies. We've seen allergies increase over time, especially things like asthma, like it's increased like 900% in the last 10 years. We're going to see that continue increase and that's going to become the norm. We've already acknowledged the fact that 54% of children have chronic illnesses. We're okay with that. That's what the Health and Human Services, HSS, HHS has said, and the CDC. So 54%. So now that, that number is going to flip. It's going to go way past that. And again, mental illness is going to be, I have more kids coming in now with high levels of anxiety. And kids who are already on some spectrum or ADD or ADHD, that has accelerated enormously. Parents don't even know what to do with them. The medications aren't working anymore. So again, what you're doing is deoxygenating the brain. 
We all know what that is because that's what CSF does. It brings that to it. And the sedentary lifestyle reduces respiratory mechanics, um, reduces CSF, locks the sacral nutation, creates stress. I think it was Christopher Kent said that if you have loss of the cervical curve, depending on how tall you are, you can stretch the dermal meningeal system anywhere from five to seven centimeters. So you stretch the dural system, it actually can tear. It's not a pliable system. It's a connective tissue. You get it too far and it tears, create micro tears, scar tissue. So what we're basically doing is affecting the overall health of our children for I don't even know how many generations, long, be long after I'll be not here. I know. And it, it's scary how this is unfolding. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's really interesting to look at the trends now and recognize how it's already impacting children. And then looking um, as they start to go through their developmental area, uh, periods, you know, all right. of us, we had that natural development where we were outside, right. we were playing, we right. had natural right. stimulation, you know, and so this will have a long, a long-term effect. Now, from a clinical perspective, any recommendations for practitioners, either for at home or something they can do in office for releasing the psoas or any um, respiration um, activities to give patients to do at home? Oh, so the psoas stretches, I'm, I mean, basically anything you want to do to, I mean, the problem is that most muscles don't react um, by themselves. In other words, there's a neurological input that's creating it. So yeah, stretching the psoas is helpful, but what is the trigger to do that? So just stretching the psoas without being under some kind of chiropractic care to find out the underlying reason. Basically, what we call positive muscle controls. Muscles don't contract for no reason. They have a reason for retracting, either compensatory or advert neurological input. So we do talk to people at stretching the psoas muscle. Um, we talk as far as practitioners, it's just a hand. There's two things that you look at is, yeah, you really want to adjust to correct the psoas muscle soft tissue, but you also need to go back into like T11 and T12 where it attaches and make sure the transition area between the lumbar and the th uh, thoracic spine is clear. And if that is not clear, that's going to affect psoas muscle. The other thing you want to look for is lumbar rotations because the psoas attaches into the disc. So the two things that I three things that I look at when I'm dealing with especially chronic psoas muscle is lumbar rotations transitionary T11 and T12. And then of course, trying to release the psoas manually. Um, and basically you make a, a line between the umbilicus and the um, ASIS, and you can divide that into three sections, upper, medial, and lower psoas muscle. But again, first thing for any chiropractor, find the neurological insult, change that, and then reset it. And as far as patients doing psoas muscle stretches, any extensions tend to do that. Anytime you're going, so people over exercise balls can help do that. Uh, I've seen psoas muscle things that they sell online that you can stretch psoas, but it's basically anything that opens up the space between your diaphragm and your pelvis helps open up the psoas muscle. Yeah. And which is amazing because again, going back to that sedentary lifestyle, yeah. when we're seated and we're flexed forward, we're right. decreasing that space. So going Absolutely. into that nice extensor pattern. Absolutely. I love that. Dr. Marty Rosen, thank you again so much. Remind us where we can learn more from your great teachings and follow all the great work you're doing. Sure. So if you go to peakpotentialprogram.com, you can find out all our seminars are on that. If you go to drmartinrosen.com, you can also um, see what streaming videos and books that we have for sale. Um, those are the two best places to reach me professionally. If you want to reach me um, as a chiropractor, then my um, office is Wellesley, W-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y, Cairo. Dot com. Um, but again, any one of those avenues or drmartinrose.com, if you contact us, we'll be glad to help you, talk to you, and help you improve your pediatric chiropractic care, because that's what we're about. Amazing. You know, as we wrap up another great session here on Peds Week Online, Dr. Marty Rosen, I would love to acknowledge you and thank you for the incredible pioneering work that you've been doing um, on behalf of pediatric practices and leading the way in educating like-minded like practitioners. Thank you for the amazing work you're doing. Thank and I'd also like, yeah. yeah, and I'd also like to acknowledge you, the healthcare provider who's learning up to date clinical solutions to serve your patients at a higher level. I'm Dr. Krista, your host on Peds Week Online. Be sure to get the Pediatric Clinical Pearl Super Pack for ongoing summit access and tools for simple implementation into your practice. Stay tuned, and we'll see you on the next Pediatric Masterclass.